Okay, so this month we're going to talk about installation and packaging with CPAC. So to, we, first we got to discuss some terminology here and get this straight because it's a little confusing. Normally you think of installation as the process of getting a package installed onto your system, but in CMake terms, um, while that can be done, usually what you want to do is use the install process to create a directory structure containing the payload uh, for packaging, and then use a packaging step to take the directory structure that you just created and, and wrap that up in a redistributable package that end consumers can use. So um, it, it's, it's a little bit confusing because if you get a CMake-based uh, project and it has install logic in it and you build the install target with nothing else, it could very likely you know, install everything locally on your machine, but it wouldn't install it from a package. So for instance, on Windows, while the files would be there, there wouldn't be an entry in like add remove programs. It, it, you know, and to remove everything off, it, it, CMake doesn't have any concept of an uninstall. It just has concept of an install. So you would install everything on your machine and then you'd have no coherent record of how all those files ended up on your machine and where they ended up getting written to. And so if you wanted to go and delete everything that was installed because you wanted to uninstall the thing, you wouldn't have a, a uniform or consistent way of going and scraping up all the little bits that got put onto your machine. And so that's the idea of what a package does is the package collects everything together into one unit that can be atomically installed and uninstalled and either you get it all or you get none of it and when you uninstall it everything that was added is removed both of these are um, a cmake driven process that just executes a, a script that contains cmake commands in the case of the install what happens is as your CMake script is processed. I believe it happens at CMake configure time. A script is written out that describes the installation steps to take when that project is, uh, when its install target is invoked, when its install target is built. So if you just build the project, you just build the code, all that happens is all the files are compiled. And the installation script is created, but it is not executed. By um, default, if you are you say you're using the make file generator, if you say make all, that does not execute the process of installing the code, of creating the directory structure that has the install image. Um, and it's similarly, the package step is not created or is not executed when you say make all in Visual Studio or in Xcode if you just build the project or build the solution it does not do the install or package steps so it can be a little bit confusing so technically through CMake if you say make install it could install it on your local machine but because you didn't install it from a package it's typically not what you want to do so typically what you do in a development scenario is you execute the install target, but you say stage all the installation over to some temporary area where you're just going to write out all the directory structure. And then you say, and then go package it up from there. So now, but you're going to have both are going to be in your CMake. So you would have an install section and a package section. Right. Yeah, or, we'll see is, how you include that into okay. your CMake script. Um, cool. But yes, uh, it, in 
pa- the packaging part is a little different, and we'll see how that's different. Uh, the packaging part is more similar to C test, the way we described uh, C test. Although both of the install process and the packaging process both operate by writing out a script and then invoking that script um, to do the necessary operation. Uh, and the scripts are just full of CMake commands. That's all they are. So the thing about packaging is that you really want to consider packaging early in your project development because how things are packaged can have implications for the code because if you decide that um, you're going to use shared objects, then... How are those shared objects going to be located? Different platforms have different mechanisms for locating dependent shared objects. And if you do it uh, without some forethought, then you know it could be fine on Linux, but then on Windows, you find out that you start having conflicts because you've got two different applications that are using Qt, and the the way that you are locating the shared objects, which on Windows is through the path, the search path. Um, you find the other guy's QT library before yours, and now you're using the wrong version, and, and, and things are just going haywire. The other wrinkle is that um, if you have ancillary files that you need to locate at runtime, then you know you can't just rely on the local path on your development machine. Um, maybe those source files are coming. From sorry, maybe those data files are coming from your source tree, in which case their location is going to depend on where you checked out your source tree from version control in terms of the absolute path. Maybe those data files are dynamically generated at build time, but they're not dynamically generated at runtime. So you're locating those data files by looking into the build directory rather than looking into the source directory. Uh, There may be other resource files that you need to locate, like translation files that contain localization resources to translate your user interface into, uh, or to localize your user interface into a variety of languages, and so on. So you you need to consider these things up front, and um, trying to retrofit them in later can be painful, because you may have to go through a large code base and look for all the place where you're using magic directory paths that can't be assumed when the code is running from a deployed package as opposed to just running from your build tree. So best to think all these things up front and get that sorted out. So the main thing is to decide on the directory layout of the installed package. And the platform that you're targeting may impose constraints that you can't avoid. So. On Linux, there's a file system hierarchy standard. And um, while this isn't something that they impose in a sense that the operating system won't let you put files wherever you want, it would mean that uh, the packaging managers for the various Linux distributions would most likely not accept your package into their, if your package is open source, They would most likely not accept your package into their um, standard distribution because your package is all weird and using different locations. In um, Mac OS, uh, Apple has a a mechanism called a framework and another mechanism called a bundle. And these impose, impose additional constraints on how and where files can be put. So you, you, you may not get a choice. You may be forced under certain circumstances to put files in specific locations. There is a CMake module called GNU Installers that if you include that, it will define a consistent layout for the various types of files. And the, um, the various types of files are all their target locations in the um, installation tree are just specified through CMake variables, CMake install whatever, like CMake install binder for bi- for executable files, CMake install libdir for library files, and um, how these variables are interpreted is is slightly different for different platforms because of the constraints of the platform. 
But um, if you include GNU install there, it will give you a consistent layout. And if you don't have a reason to be different, like a good compelling reason, um, it's best to adopt the standard layout. There's also the concept of a relocatable directory layout. And this is the idea of an installation structure that doesn't have any absolute path or environment dependencies. And the advantage of this is that it allows your code to be installed and run from anywhere. Um, for instance, this is what people do when they want to have the application that they can carry around with them and they can use it on any machine just by attaching a USB drive into the machine and running the programs from the USB drive. So obviously those USB drives are going to be mounted in different places on different computers. Um, another option is people often would like the ability to install the program in their home directory because maybe they're on a system where they don't have permission to install it in a system-wide location. All they have is right access to their user directory. So they'd like to be able to install it there so that they can run it without having to have administrative privileges on the machine. Obviously, if we're talking about something like a device driver or a kernel module, this isn't going to be feasible. But if it's an application, um, this is usually uh, very feasible. And uh, if you use a, a relocatable directory layout, you may not even need a fancy installer. Maybe all you need to do is just provide it as a zip file that people can unpack anywhere they want. So um, that's another thing to consider. Um, CMake has a variable called CMake install prefix, and this is the base install location. So every uh, all the other variables that you set, like CMake install libdir, CMake install binder, you typically set those to relative locations underneath CMake install prefix. And when you're developing, you might want to consider setting this to a subdirectory of your binary directory so that when you say make install, it never accidentally throws it in your system wide area. It just builds the install image tree in your build directory. So that way you you can do make install, you can do uh, make package, you can build the package, and then you can test installing it on your local machine in the system-wide location by testing the execution of the installer package. Um, there's also this destdir mechanism. It's only on uh, non-Windows platforms, and it's similar to the suggestion of setting CMake install prefix to your binary dir subdirectory. You can use destdir when you uh, invoke the install target and it basically destdir will be prefixed onto the CMake install prefix. So you could set CMake install prefix, for instance, on Linux, you might set it to like slash opt. And then you could say destdir equals slash temp and invoke the install process and it would go into slash temp slash opt instead of slash opt. So uh, for the, there's a variety of things we need to install. And the major one you want to install is a target that is built by your project. So you can install an arbitrary number of targets with the install command. And entity is um, describing uh, the kinds of things that are going to be placed in specific locations. So Runtime is typically the place where you're going to put your executables, so the, the programs that you've linked. Library is where you're going to put um, any library files that you need, like uh, dynamic libraries on non-Windows platforms. We'll get to the details of that in a second. Archive is where your... Um, Static libraries on Unix in the olden days used to be maintained by a program called AR, which was the archiver, and that's why they have .a suffix on Unix. So the archive uh, entity is where your static libraries are going to go. You can specify destination directory uh, specific permissions if you need to. You can associate the installed files with a component, and we'll talk about components a little bit later. 
you can specify particular build configurations to which these uh, installation targets are associated. So for instance, you may want to install a debug build of your library in a different directory than the release uh, build of your libraries. There's kind of two different ways of thinking of release versus debug libraries. In the Unix world, the uh, tradition has been um, to sometimes include a D in the name of the library. And if it's a debug build of the library and then omit the D and put them both in the same directory. Whereas on Windows, the tradition has tended to be, you have a debug directory and a release directory and they both contain library files of the same name, but they differ in that they're installed into different directories. So you might use the configurations to, uh, keyword to say, for a debug configuration, the file goes here, and for a release configuration, the file goes over there. So here's a little example. Uh, we've got a foo shared, which is a shared object target, and foo static, which is a static library target. Uh, so foo shared is a shared library, foo static is a static library. We've specified the destination for runtime files, for library files, and for archive files. Now in Windows, the shared libraries go into the um, place where runtime files need to go because in Windows, the shared objects are found by using the executable search path. So on Windows, foo shared will be installed into Binder because that's the runtime destination. And with a Windows shared object, there's also a thing called an import library. This is what clients of the shared object link against to get the references in their linked executable to the shared object. And uh, those are import libraries or .lib files, typically. They can be named anything, but their standard is to name them .lib. And those are going to be installed into libdir because that is the archive destination. A Linux shared object will go to libdir because that is the library destination. And static libraries on all platforms will go to libdir because that's the archive destination. Now in, in here, we gave libdir as the destination for both library and archive entity types. They could be different, in which case, the Linux shared library would end up going to whatever we said was the library destination and not the archive destination. In this case, library and archive were specified to be the same directory, so they both ended up in the same place. So, in addition to what we just described in differences about the directory structure between platforms, on Linux, there's a convention, and on Unix more generally, there's a convention that shared objects participate in a versioning scheme, and that versioning scheme is reflected in a series of symbolic links that are created to link to the actual shared object from the shared object with no version in its name, or the shared object with just the major version in its name. And that is supported uh, through CMake, there are mechanisms by which you can set target properties on a shared object target to specify this information so that when you install those targets on Linux, that the appropriate sim links are created. If you don't want those sim links to be created, there's keywords to the install targets command that can suppress that information so that you can manage the sim links explicitly yourself. And you might ask, why would you want to do that? And the answer is, uh, on Linux, there is often a uh, packaging convention that there is a runtime package and a developer package for a shared object. And the runtime package for a shared object installs just the shared object and not the sim links. Because the sim links are only used when you're linking a program that consumes the shared object. Programs that are bound to the shared object are bound to the full version numbered 
form of the shared object file name, and so they don't need the same links. But when we're linking, you often just say, you know, dash L foo to link against the shared library foo. And so the sim link is there to allow that linking to succeed and point to the shared object that is installed on your machine. So the runtime package will install the shared object, and then the developer package will install the sim links. So um, like most things in installation and packaging, there's lots of little annoying details and minor differences. Um, CMake and CPack give you a consistent higher level model where you can just describe these things. And usually if you just want the default behavior, you don't need to do a bunch of extra fiddly configuration. It'll just do the right thing for you. Non-Windows platforms also have a mechanism called RPath. That's the mechanism I alluded to when I said that a linked executable references explicitly the shared objects that it consumes. And the RPath mechanism allows uh, a set of locations to be searched to locate the necessary dependent shared objects. Windows doesn't do that. It just uses the path environment variable and a few other specific locations that it will search. Uh, so uh, our path support is again um, supplied through or, or manipulated and controlled through target properties on the shared library targets in CMake. So <clears throat> you might be tempted to say, hey, when you install my application, why don't I just put my application in the path for you? And this doesn't present really a problem on uh, Linux, but on Windows, because path is also used to locate dependent DLLs, you can have this problem where you you are looking for the DLL you're interested in, but it happened to be uh, specified by a file name that didn't have a version number in it or some other unique identifier like a GUID or something. And therefore I picked up by accident the DLL from somewhere else, not the one that shipped my app with my application because uh, the path of the location of the DLL by the same name in a different location, that location was listed in the path first. And so it found the first one and that wasn't mine. And then that causes all kinds of problems. <clears throat> problems that can be very difficult to debug until you figure out what's actually going on. Because you may not be able to reproduce the problem on your system, even though it's happening on a customer's system because their path variable is different from yours. So standard workaround for this is instead of putting the directory to your binary, your program executable, with the necessary side-by-side -side DLLs, instead of putting that directory in the path, you make a separate directory that contains a launch script or a standalone executable launch program whose only purpose is to put the location of your directory containing the executable and the DLLs at the front of the path and then launching your executable so that it guarantees that your DLL is going to be found first when your program is launched. And then you put the directory containing that script, you add that to the path. Uh, not a difficult workaround, but just an annoyance. One of the things you have to deal with when you are dealing with packaging and installation because platforms have differences. On Linux, you don't need to do this because the RPath mechanism is sufficient to make sure that yours is found correctly um, and also uh, the versioning requirements on uh, Linux are, um, if they're being followed correctly, they're supposed to guarantee uh, backwards compatibility. And worse comes to worse on Linux, you can use LD library path to control the location of shared objects, that, uh, where shared objects are found. So installing uh, static libraries is, is easier because uh, you just you don't need to worry about all those runtime considerations, right? A static library is just going to be put on the user's machine somewhere. And because you're installing a static library, the consumer of that is, an, is a developer. So they just need to get the static library installed so they can link against it. Now, you still have the 
consideration on Windows with MSVC that all the code that is linked together into an executable should be consistently compiled. So that means if you are building for the multi-threaded C++ runtime and the single-threaded C++ runtime and the debug flavor of the runtime and the release flavor of the runtime and the static version of the runtime and versus the DLL version of the runtime, we're already up to, uh, let's see, I think eight combinations. And a lot of people just deal with that by reducing the number of combinations that they support. Maybe they don't ship debug, but you still may have to ship multi-threaded and single-threaded and DLL versus static. So there's still variants to consider. So you may want to think about that when you're thinking about your directory structure to include subdirectories for these different uh, variations. For instance, when yeah. you build boost and you tell it to build all the combinations, you get eight flavors of every library. Now, does the architecture like x86 versus x64, does that also multiply to another set of if you're going to ship 32-bit flavors and 64-bit flavors of your library on that's that's another doubling up of the number of flavors that you need to support yes i think at this point very few people are supplying libraries as 32-bit libraries um pretty much everybody has switched to 64-bit so the easiest way to Make your life simpler is to not support it if you don't have to. I, I would I would say that at this point, 32-bit code is considered legacy code, and it's there for compatibility, but um, it, it's unusual for people to be shipping new applications as 32-bit applications. And if they are, it's simply because they are still supporting 32-bit environments. There's no reason to ship 32-bit executables if your target is a 64-bit operating system. The only reason to ship 32-bit executables is if you have a compatibility matrix that requires either a 32-bit operating system be the target or you're shipping libraries and you are supporting customers that are building 32-bit executables and linking against your libraries. Nice. Okay, so installing headers. Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, you can install headers by just installing a target. So if a target is a library and you've followed best CMake practices, as we've discussed in the past few meetups, about specifying the interface directory for your target as uh, using target properties, you specified a public interface directory, then um, you can also use um, those same target properties to control the header files that are installed for a target. You can also just install the header files as plain files. And you may run into a situation where uh, your source tree directory structure does not parallel your desired deployed directory structure, but you can use uh, generator expressions when you specify the uh, target include directories for a target so that when you're getting the um, include directory property for at build time, you get one value. And when you're getting the include directory property for a target at install time, you get a different value. You can see the example of that here of using generator expressions to supply XXX when it's build and YYY as the directory when it's the, uh, the install location. Now, <clears throat> When we talked about, in a previous meetup, I think it was two meetups ago, when we talked about finding packages on a system, we talked about find modules, 
And when we found the necessary uh, component on the system that we were interested in, we created an imported target for the found component. The opposite of that is exporting targets from your build, and this results in a CMake script being created that when consumed by the find module will define the imported targets for the components that you're going to install on the system. So <clears throat> this is preferable to custom find logic because it means that when, say you're installing an SDK, you're creating a, a package for your own SDK. So when your SDK is installed, then the little CMake script that is installed with your SDK is used by the find module. And because the CMake script that was written out when your SDK was installed, it has guaranteed all the correct values because that little CMake script is generated by CMake at the time that that SDK is installed. So it contains all the correct paths, all the correct values, and then the find module can rely on that because it's got a better idea. Your own SDK has a better idea of the appropriate settings for your SDK than uh, ad hoc find logic in the find module. So the find module can consume this and they're like, oh, great. There was uh, a CMake script that installed that gave me the imported targets and I don't need to do any heuristic logic to try and determine what the values are. <coughs> Excuse me. So, and you may just need to install arbitrary files or entire directories. And typically this is uh, the files and directories that you're going to be installing are ancillary resources for your application, like localization resources that contain translations of user interface strings or data files or data directories that need to go with your product. Maybe it's help files, maybe it's uh, user guide documentation in the form of PDF, whatever. You can install arbitrary stuff. Uh, the only difference between the files and the programs variant is that when you install a program, the execute bit is set on the file in the uh, installation target, whether it was set in the, in the source environment or not. So shell scripts, you might want to use um, like bash shell scripts on Linux. You might want to make sure that you use install programs to get those installed to make sure that they have the execute bit set uh, when they're deployed into the target environment. That was cool. You may also find that um, the boilerplate instructions that came from installing, you know, files and targets, programs, directories, those boilerplate instructions may not be specific enough for your needs. And this usually revolves around customizing various uh, variables and uh, properties depending on the package generator that you use. And just to give one small example, you specify an icon for your package by setting a variable that is basically global. It's a CMake install variable. And when you do that, the value that is supplied to different packaging generators has constraints imposed by the packaging generator. So on Windows, it might the constraint might be that it has to be in a Windows icon file, or on Linux, it might be required to be a PNG file. You know, they obviously can't have a PNG file and a Windows icon file in the same file, so we need different values for those variables. And so sometimes, you, you know, that's just one example of a place where you might need to insert a little custom logic to set the value of a variable to be different depending on subsequent needs of either the target platform or the, the target packaging infrastructure. So if you need to do that, you can insert either a piece of code using the code form, or you can insert all the code that's in a file. And the code here is CMake commands. 
So if you just need to insert one command, you can use the code with a string. If you have a series of commands, you have know, some complex logic you need to do, um, easier to put that into a script file and then use the script form. Um, you can associate those in, that install logic with a component. We haven't discussed components yet, but we will in a second. And the exclude from all basically um, is again part of the component infrastructure, which we'll we'll get to. Now, after you've decided on your directory structure and you've added all the install commands to your um, CMake lists in order to get the files installed in the correct place, you'll want to test it. So the, um, the generators provide either an install target in lowercase for the make file style generators or Ninja or what have you, basically all the ones that are uh, outside of an IDE, all the non-multi-configuration project generators. And the um, multi-configuration project generators like Visual Studio have a target install in all caps. And you can invoke CMake with dash dash install and point to your builder and then you probably also want to set either destdir or cmake install prefix on the command line so that you're not installing it into your system globally, but you're setting installing, creating the install image into a, um, you know, maybe a subdirectory of your build directory, and so on. And whatever other arguments pass to cmake, and you can invoke that, uh, if you pass the dash dash install, it will invoke CMake will invoke the necessary target. So you don't have to remember, is it the lowercase one or the uppercase one? Uh, so when you want to test your install logic, what you want to do is do that installation step to a staging area and then just go browse that directory hierarchy and make sure all the files that are there are supposed that are supposed to be there are there. You know, you can test that the executables launch correctly from that location. Uh, make sure there's no missing files. Make sure the files have the right permissions. Make sure the directories have the correct permissions. Sometimes you need to create a directory that is writable. So you, you, you'll need to check those permissions. All those sorts of things. Basically, this is a way for you to get a directory tree that has all the stuff you said you wanted to install with all the right permissions all the right directory structure, and that's what you're validating in the install logic. The next thing you'll probably want to do after you've got that all sorted out is you'll want to take your install tree and find a way to create a, a redistributable package that people can use to install it on their machine from the package. So um, packaging is similar to testing like we did with ctest cpack is a separate command like ctest and it processes a package script and generates a package from that package script the package script is just cmake commands the cpack module simplifies the generation of the cpack script from your cmake lists and the cpack uh, module is configured through cmake variables so just like we did with ctest in your cmake lists when you were doing testing you said include ctest and then you did like enable testing and add test and so on and that created a test script and then you could invoke that test script with ctest the ctest executable so here we're going to include cpack having configured a bunch of variables for it and maybe we also invoke more cpack related commands and then that results in a packaging script being generated. And then we process that packaging script with CPAC. And that creates the redistributable package from our CPAC script. Now, typically what your process is going to be is you'll do a build. And then you do an install to a staging area. And then you run CPAC and point it at the staging area. And that builds a package from the staged structure that you created with your install step. So 
One wrinkle with CPAC is that CPAC should be the last thing included from your top level CMake lists. So uh, a recommendation is in your top level CMake lists at the very end of it, uh, you, you know, either set all the packaging stuff explicitly or and include CPAC or you inc it can include a subdirectory that contains just all the packaging stuff in a separate separated CMake lists. That's the example I've gone with here. And here you'll see there's this test of saying if CMake source dir is equal to CMake current source dir to add subdirectory packaging. The point of that is you should always strive to have your CMake lists be written in such a way that it can be directly included in another project. And it's only the global top level CMake lists that should include CPAC. So what we're doing with that if statement is we're basically saying CMake Sourcester is the global top level Seem, look, is the location of the directory containing the global top level CMake list.txt is being processed. So we're only going to add this packaging subdirectory if our current source dir is the global source dir, which basically says if this CMake list that we're processing right now is the global top level CMake list. So that's the only reason that, that's the only purpose of that if clause. Um, if you're not intending for your thing to be embedded, you can just do add subdirectory packaging and have the packaging CMake list contain all your packaging logic. So typically what you're going to have is setting a bunch of CPAC variables and then include CPAC and that um, setting of the variables is configuring the behavior that CPAC is going, the CPAC module is going to give you. So here's a set of suggested minimum CPAC variables that you should be setting. You can see there's the name of the package, description summary, the vendor of the package. All of these, by the way, do not have reasonable defaults, which is why it is suggested that at a minimum you set every one of these. There's the version major, minor, and patch of the package. Uh, we'll see an example of how to set all these in just a second, so you can see what typical values are. The uh, package install directory, uh, CPAC verbatim variables. This is a uh, setting that is, um, this variable controls a legacy behavior and it's in legacy mode by default. And what you want to do is set verbatim variables to true and that forces the variables to have all their values written out to the CPAC packaging script when CPAC generates that script. Instead of writing them out as variable references, the variable values are written out. And that just gives you a more robust packaging script because then all the values that are in that script are all, for instance, they're all absolute paths and specific values instead of other variable references. Uh, the package description file the resource file welcome, resource file license, resource file readme. These are all variables that contain the location of files that provide various descriptive text. And the package icon is the icon that is used for the package, regardless of what generator you are using to generate the package. So here's an example of setting this. Um, just because I didn't want the text to be too tiny, i am just set a local variable ccld to cmake current lister for the file locations and that's because all those file locations should be absolute locations so um, I just use that to shorten up the text a little bit uh, you can see our you know we've got a package named foo and the vendor is Frobo's electric and this the summary is foo generator uh, oh I got a typo there in my description summary the foo generator is just a short phrase text meant to describe this package. And that's for things like um, if you've ever used on Linux, if you've ever used like apt-get or apt-search, 
it's the one line description of the package. So you don't want it to be this long verbose thing. That's why it's a description summary. If you want a long description, you can put that in your description.txt. That's the package description file. The install directory just defaults to the package, excuse me, the package name in this case. I'm setting the version of the package to match the version of my project and that verbatim variables set that to true and then the locations of those files and then I include CPAC and then the package script is generated by the inclusion of CPAC. So we've mentioned components and um, components here are just a way to group this set of files that are installed. And they're just, as far as CPAC is concerned, components are just names. You associate files when you install them with the component names, and then component names can have relationships to each other to be arranged in a hierarchy. Components can also have dependency relationships so that, you know, if you're going to install the header files, you also have to install the library files or whatever other relationship might exist between groups of files in your product. Uh, through components, you also can establish, um, it's not supported by every project or every package generator, but you can establish things like, uh, there's the typical install, there's the, you know, the custom install and the advanced install or the, you know, different flavors of install that are just basically selecting which components are installed by default. You can um, create components by referencing them with the component keyword when you are installing files. But if that uh, isn't enough, for instance, you might have components whose only purpose is to aggregate other components. So you can use CPAC add component and CPAC add component group to define more components and their relationships between components. Uh, there's a lot of options to those commands. So you go look in the uh, CMake and CPAC documentation to get the details on that. Um, there's a wrinkle with uh, multi configuration packages, and this is where you want to include like debug and release files in a single package. And the wrinkle here is that some generators do not support multiple configurations at once. So what, you, for instance, with the makefile generator, the makefile generator is not a multi-configuration um, project. It does not generate multi-configuration makefiles. It generates a makefile that is for a particular configuration. So you tell it the build type when you're generating the makefile project you tell it, say, that it is CMake build type release or CMake build type debug. And that gets you a build that has the debug configuration and a separate build that has the release configuration. So if you want to package debug and release into a single package, now you've got a wrinkle because you don't have a single build that generates both sets of files. So there's um, two ways you can do this. The advanced way is to use this CMake install CMake projects variable and write some more custom CMake script. And for fancy configurations, that's probably what you're going to have to do. A simpler, less portable mechanism is to use CPAC and then give it the dash C argument, which lists the configurations to be packaged. And when you do that, the reason it's less portable is that flavor only works for projects that support multiple configurations. Uh, the details are in the documentation. Um, a lot of these things, we if I drilled into all the details on it, you know, this talk would go on for like four hours or something. So um, I want you to be aware of that if you need to, if you need this and you can, it can be done. You can figure out how to do it. Lots of people have done it. So you won't be, you know, blazing new territory, but, uh, We'll just defer the details for your later research. Um, now, the package generators come in a variety of flavors. There's um, an archive generator, and this is what if you just need, you know, perhaps you decided that you wanted a uh, 
relocatable directory structure. You don't need to do things like write things into the Windows registry or install, you know, uh, startup scripts for your daemon on Linux or anything like that. All you need to do is provide a directory structure of stuff. So simplest thing to do is just use like a an archive generator that will just create a zip or a tarball. And then when the user gets that, they pretty much everybody understands you just unzip it or untar it in order to get the contents. Um, the GUI generators uh, can be used to generate um, what a, a Windows user would be very comfortable with, which is a little setup program that when they launch it, and then they tell Windows, yes, I want to give it permission to install things on my computer. And then a little sequence of dialogues comes up that they click through to install the product. Uh, Nullsoft scriptable install system is an example of this. Um, Windows installer MSI files are an example of this. There's also a Qt based installer that is supported through CPAC. There's also for Linux, Debian, and Red Hat Package Manager packages. And uh, those are, I think a lot of Linux users are more comfortable with the command line. So I would say those are probably more often installed from the command line. There are GUI front ends on uh, Linux that allow you to install packages uh, through that GUI, but it's really just... Um, the GUI is not supplied by the package itself. It's a little GUI front end for the package manager that is supplying uh, that user interface. And generally, you have generator specific options, and these are all configured through CMake variables uh, before you that you would set before including CPAC. And then there's also a way that you can slip in some arbitrary code. Again, it's CMake code, so invocation of CMake commands. And these can be invoked um, per generator. So you, you may say that, um, you know, I'm on Windows, I'm going to build an MSI, but I'm also going to build a zip file. And you may need to set some uh, CMake variables differently if you're building a zip file versus building an MSI file. So you can slip in some code that does that test and sets the variable correctly. Uh, the archive generators are all customized by setting CPAC archive variables. Uh, they don't support components uh, by default and it results in a single archive. You can do a... And so when I say it doesn't support a component by default, by default, unless you do do something otherwise, and you say build me a, a an archive style package, it just builds a single archive and all your component specification stuff was ignored. You can get a component based install by setting a variable to enable this. And then I believe what happens, I haven't tested this myself, so I'm not 100% certain. But I believe what happens is then you get a, an archive for every component that you described in your component tree. So now you don't just get one archive, you get kind of a bag of archives and you have to add some explicit code in order to set the expected directory structure when it's unpacked. And this is because with a single archive, say your, your package was called, you know, foo-1.0.zip. The default behavior of the archiver when you unpackaged that, when you unpacked the zip file, would be to create a directory called foo-1.0 and put everything inside there. When you get an archive per component, so say I had two components, bar and baz, in my, um, in my description of my my foo build so i'd get a bar dot zip and a baz dot zip and when i unpack those they just go into the bar and baz directories but what i really wanted was foo dash 1.0 slash bar and all the stuff in the bar package underneath there and foo dash 1.0 slash baz and all the stuff in the baz package to go into there you want that behavior you gotta write some more um, cmake code 
and inject that into the CPAC script in order to get that directory structure to work the way you're expecting. Um, again, this is documented. Um, it can be it can be done. It's just the the archive package generator does not do this by default when you tell it to create a package per component. So if you want that behavior, you need to do a little extra work. The Qt installer framework uh, is referred to as the IFW package generator. This creates a cross-platform GUI installer. So if you want a GUI installer, but you don't want to have to create different flavors of GUI installer for the different operating systems, so you're going to target Windows, Linux, and or Mac, you can use the IFW package generator and you will get a consistent experience in terms of the GUI across all the platforms. Uh, the CPAC IFW variables control all the customization points and there's lots of customization points. And this controls things like, should it display a license dialog that you must agree to before you can click through to install the application? Should it display a readme that is uh, displayed at the end of the installation? Um, we've got strings in this GUI of, for the installer and we may be running the installer in some foreign language environment that's not English, so we may want to localize the strings in that installer, et cetera, et cetera. The one main advantage that it has is that it supports downloading install components from a URL. So if you have a very large component that's optional, you can set it up so that they can download a small installer package and then if they request that optional component it'll download it off the network before um, proceeding with the installation there's extra commands that can be used to manipulate uh, ifw uh, based packages and you can include cpac ifw to get those extra commands and again lots of details in the documentation on all the options that you can configure. For generating MSI files, there's a package generator called Wix. Uh, Wix is the Windows Installer XML Toolkit. It is an open source package that generates an MSI file from an XML input. And what the CPAC generator does is take your CPAC description of your package it generates the XML file input to Wix, and then it runs Wix to get the MSI file from the XML file that it created on your behalf. And the nice thing about this is that on Windows, it, it integrates with add remove programs and the whole Windows installer infrastructure. So that means things like Windows installer supports a feature called repair. So if a user accidentally deletes or corrupts some of the files in your install image they can run a repair operation to get those files replaced or uh, restored it supports patching and upgrading of uh, installed products following windows installer guidelines um, unfortunately it didn't although windows installer supports a component uh, hierarchy the Wix generator does not, so your component organization is ignored. There is no support for downloading components, and packages created in this manner must observe the Windows installer rules, um, which have specific behavior around upgrading what uh, Windows installer considers a minor upgrade ver and a major upgrade. And it, if you don't do this, uh, d d if, you, if you don't do things correctly, it may mean that the user cannot have two different versions of your application installed at the same time side by side. Now, you may view that as desirable. If they install version 3, you may view it as desirable that version 2 will be removed from the system before version 3 is installed. That's a major upgrade. You also may view it desirable as if they have version 3.1 and they install 3.2, 3.1 is removed from the machine before 3.2 is put down. You may also view that as desirable. You could also view these things as undesirable, 
You can get either behavior by controlling the variables that you pass to Wix or that you set to configure Wix, but you just need to be aware of those rules and it, it may be a little bit obtuse, these Windows installer rules, but um, it is possible to get the different variations of behavior uh, that you desire. The NSIS generator is the Nullsoft scriptable install system and you can figure that with CPAC NSIS variables. Um, there was also, uh, with, a, with an MSI package, there's the ability to do a so-called unattended install, which is you can run a command and the installation will proceed and no GUI will be displayed. Um, that can be important for people that want to deploy packages in a corporate environment where they want to use Windows group policy to push down the installation of packages to a bunch of different machines. Um, it means that that can be done in an administrative fashion and no UI flashes up. It, it, it may even run in a context where there's no user interface, uh, some, you know, available because it's running in a kind of a remote network kind of session where there's no desktop attached to it. So uh, the command line installation for MSI and for NSIS, this can be uh, an important feature. So NSIS also installs, uh, supports this, the ability to have an unattended install. It also ignores the component organization that is specified. It does not support downloading of components and it does not support localization of the user interface. And if you need to do a change, if you know, if you made some choices when you're installing uh, the code at the beginning, and then you want to change that, you can't do that by modifying the installation that you have. You have to uninstall it and reinstall it. Um, now for Linux, people are more typically going to target uh, RPM or dead packages. And for these, they, the package itself does not specify any user interface. It only specifies the installation requirements. And they're very, very similar. Um, the main difference is that RPM packages require a special tool to create them. Whereas the, the Debian packages are basically just an archive with some metadata in the archive. So for these package generators, if you're going to use RPM, then the RPM package tool has to be installed on your system. If you run the, the Debian package manager, you can just do it with CPAC. Um, and they're configured again with variables that you set. Um, and that's the end of this presentation. So just to summarize again, let's go back to the beginning. The install process, although it can be used to get the product installed from your build onto your machine locally, it, it's generally not a good idea to do that. Instead, what you want to do is install things into a staging area and then run the packaging step pointed at your staging area to create a package. And then if you want to and test the installation on your machine locally, you can test by installing that package. Now, having done a lot of install and upgrade testing over the years, I didn't mention it in the slides, but I'll mention it now. My recommendation for testing is to always do the install and upgrade testing in a virtual machine. Because if you have bugs in your installer that scribble files into random locations, it's really annoying to have to go and clean that up manually. So the best thing is to use a virtual machine, test it in the virtual machine, and then when you're done testing, you can just revert the virtual machine back to its original snapshot state. And this is particularly useful when testing upgrades uh, because you can have virtual machines with all of the previous versions of your product already installed from the same packages that the customer would have used to install the product. You can also do things like on Windows, a common mistake is to assume everything is on the C drive. 
So you can create an, a machine image where your product is installed on the D drive and not on the C drive. Uh, these very um, easy things to do with a virtual machine image are very difficult to do with uh, trying to clean up the mess on your own machine, especially if it's your development machine. You may put your development machine in such a bad state that you need to reinstall the operating system from scratch. And while these problems are generally more prevalent on Windows, you can get into the same state on Linux if you're doing things like installing scripts that start daemons and things that change permissions, things that create users, things that subtract users, things that use complex permission sets, uh, access control lists, and so on. So depending on the complexity of things, uh, a virtual machine can be for testing can be a real lifesaver. But to summarize, install will get you a directory structure. I always recommend using that step on a staging area. And then packaging will create a redistributable package from that directory structure. And both are driven by scripts written out by your CMake lists. And those scripts are just CMake scripts that contain invocation of CMake commands. So if you're having difficulty with something getting not quite configured the way you thought it was, you can always look at the generated CMake scripts and read them. They're just plain text files. So you can always look at those generated scripts and see exactly what is going on. Um, hopefully you don't need to dig that deeply. The documentation is pretty good, so you should just be able to figure things out from the documentation. And plenty of people have done these things before, so if you get in trouble, you can ask on Stack Overflow or other forums and people will help you out. So that's all we have. Any questions? No questions, but great job. That was awesome. Okay. So let's stop this recording. Mm -hmm.